Thank you, Kim and uh, Brooke. We want to say thanks to Brooke and also to Charity and the choir and Susan for uh, the good music this morning. And we want to especially thank uh, Kathy and Randy who are filling in for Mike and Lynn. So would you express appreciation to them? I think I've found biblical evidence this week that a man ought to make coffee for his wife every morning. There is a book called He Brews. I know, that's bad, isn't it? It's a, a bad joke, but a good segue. Turn to the book of Hebrews, chapter 11. Hebrews, chapter 11. I hope you've had a good week, but... Regardless of what kind of week you've had, I know the Word of God today will speak to some hearts in this room and in our other service in the gym, gym this morning, the Christian Life Center. I want to talk to you about when your faith is tested. When your faith is tested. Life's not easy, is it? In fact, there are times in our life when it's just downright hard. It's tough. And we wonder how we're going to make it. And we wonder what else can come our way. And that's not uncommon in the life of the believer. But God has a word. When things are like that, He teaches us today in Hebrews 11 what to do when our faith is tested. So let's stand together, Hebrews chapter 11. And we're going to read just a couple of verses. We'll be working with more verses than we read. But let's begin with verse 17. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, In Isaac your seed shall be called concluding that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. Let's pray together. Lord God, today we ask that you take the Word of God and let the Spirit of God implant it deep in our hearts and our minds. For those today who may be enduring a time of testing. Lord, may your word bring great hope and encouragement to them today. And for those who may not need this message right now, may you help them to tuck it away so that the Spirit of God can bring it when they need it. And I pray, Father, that you will teach us the things you want us to learn today from your word. And let us be not only hearers of your word, but doers. In the name of Christ, we pray. And all of God's people said, Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. There are times in the life of the Christian when our faith will be put to the test. Years ago, I heard Adrian Rogers make a statement that the Holy Spirit just drove into my heart. I've never forgotten it. I think about it a lot. He said, a faith that cannot be tested is a faith that cannot be trusted. And our faith as Christians will be tested from time to time. Maybe right now, your faith today is being tested. I, I want to say this to you, and I hope you'll remember it. God honors His people by the severity of the test He allows to come to them in life. Think about Job in Scripture. Job went through an awful time of testing. Now, God knew what Job was going through because God is sovereign. God saw it all. Job didn't understand what was going on, but Job trusted God. And if you read the story... The end was better than the beginning. And so during times of testing, we need to be reminded that God has not forgotten us. God understands what we're going through. God knows exactly what we're going through. 
He's sovereign. In fact, He knew we would go through it before it ever started. And He also knows how it's all going to turn out. And the Bible says, with God, all things are possible. Now, it may not always turn out the way we want it to or the way we hope it will, but it'll turn out the way God wants it to. Amen? And God knows exactly what we need. Abraham is the man we're looking at today in his life. He lived by faith. In fact, as you read the story of Abraham in the Word of God, you will see that he looked for the promises of God, he listened to the promises of God, and he lived by the promises of God. That's a tremendous lesson for all of us. But I want you to notice today three things in Abraham's life as we think about when your faith is tested. Notice first Abraham's excitement. Look at verse 11. By faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed. And she bore a child when she was past the age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Now, when God called Abraham, God said, Abraham, get up and go. Go to a land that I will show you. And Abraham got up and went not knowing where he was going. Abraham put his faith in God. But God also made Abraham promise. God said, Abraham, along your journey, I am going to make your offspring a great nation. Now, Abraham didn't have any children. Abraham had no heir, but God made him that promise. In fact, Abraham's wife could not have a child. She was barren. And so how could Abraham become a great nation without a child? Well, the way God works his promise to Abraham is one of the most delightful stories, exciting stories in all of the Word of God. And if you look at verse 11, we're reminded there about human frailty, the condition of Sarah, the wife of Abraham. In verse 11, it says she was past the age of childbearing. I mean, she was way past the age of childbearing. We know from the book of Genesis that she was 90 years old at this time. Now, ladies, think about that. Suppose that you are a 90-year-old woman and you get a message that you're going to have a baby. Over in the book of Genesis, the Bible says that Sarah laughed. Would you laugh? Some of you said, no, I think I'd cry. Well, Sarah always wanted a child. In fact, we read in Genesis that Sarah tried to help God out on one occasion. She was barren, and so she asked her handmaiden named Hagar to have a child with Abraham so that he would have a descendant. And they named that child Ishmael. And all of the problems in the Middle East today can be traced right back to Ishmael and Isaac, the sons of Abraham, from whence came the Arabs and the Jews. You always get in trouble when you run ahead of God. You always get in trouble when God makes you a promise, and because He chooses to delay, you take things into your own hands. If you understand, say amen. Sarah was old. She was past childbearing years. Abraham was too. He's almost 100 at this time. But look at verse 12. For one man, here's how God described him, for one man and him as good as dead were born as many as the stars of the sky. He was 100 years old, the Bible says. He was as good as dead. He had one foot in the grave and another on the banana peel. I mean, he was about at the end of his rope. But God promised him a child. There was a time back in the Old Testament when we read that Abraham had a name change. When we first meet him in the Bible, his name was not Abraham. His name was Abram. Now, the name Abram means father of many. You can almost imagine as they gathered around the fires at night and guests would come in and they would spend the night and they would meet Abraham and they would say, Sir, what is your name? And he would say, My name is Abram. Well, immediately 
They knew what that meant, father of many. And so they would say, well, how many children do you have? Well, I don't have any children. And they would snicker and mock and make fun of him behind his back. Why, did, why is his name father of many and, and he doesn't have any children? So one day out of the blue, he, he announces to the folks that he has changed his name. Now, I can hear people just snickering behind his back. So it's about time. I, I don't blame it, old boy. He's been going through all that people making fun of him for a long time. His name's father of many, and, and he has no children. What did you change your name to? He said, Abram. From Abram to Abraham. You know what Abraham means, the name? Father of multitudes. <laughs> so now... He says, I'm going from father of many to, to father of multitudes. And, and they laugh and say, that old boy's off his rocker in his old age. But he wasn't off his rocker. He just believed the promises of God. God told him what he would do. And Abraham believed God when nobody else would. The reason he changed his name, it, it was an exercise in faith, he was living by faith. God told him he would be the father of multitudes, and he believed God no matter what. He didn't live by sight. He didn't live by the circumstances that he found himself in. And when our faith is tested, we need to hold on to the promises of God. When you're going through a time of testing in your life and things look bad, don't look at what you see. Don't listen to what you hear. Don't look at your circumstances. Look at the God who can overcome your circumstances. Abraham was excited. I can imagine not too long after God told them they were going to have a child that Sarah woke up in the middle of the night. Abraham, get up. What is it, honey? Run down to the convenience store and get me some chocolate-covered tomatoes. And he knew then she was going to have a baby. He knew then. It wouldn't be long. And, and a little later, there was a baby's cry that could be heard in the tent of Sarah. And you can see that 100-year-old man running and skipping and clicking his heels all over the camp. It's a boy. It's a boy. God kept his promise. If anything, make a 100-year-old man run, skip, that'd be it. Amen? He's excited because God's Word came true. But notice here something else. God said, name this boy Isaac. <laughs> the name Isaac means laughter. Sarah laughed about it. Abraham laughed. But God got the last laugh, didn't he? All of heaven laughed. Little Isaac was born. So we see the excitement of Abraham. Then secondly, notice, if you will, verse 13. In verses 13 through 16, we see... Abraham's example. Look at this. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Now we're looking here at Abraham's testimony. His testimony is an example to you and me of how we are to live when our faith is tested. Abraham, it says, look at it, he died before possessing the land that God had promised him. In fact, the only thing that Abraham ever owned in that land that God promised him was a burial plot for his wife Sarah when she died. But the Bible says, look at it, he died in faith. He died believing God. Look at verse 13. These all died in faith. Not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them. He died in faith. You know, that's the greatest testimony a man or a woman could have. That's the greatest thing that anybody could ever say about you at your funeral that you live by faith and that you died in faith, that you died believing God. They were looking forward to the promise. And that's how we're to live. We're to live by faith. 
and we're to die by faith. That was his example. And then look at a third thing this morning. We see not only Abraham's excitement and Abraham's example, but as we move down to verse 17, we see Abraham's encounter. This was a moment in his life when his faith was about to be tested. Look at verse 17. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, The writer of Hebrews says it very clearly here. Abraham was tested. His faith was tested. And your faith and my faith will be tested. Now we read about this in Genesis 22. There's a difference, by the way, between testing and temptation. God will test us to make us stronger. Satan will tempt us to make us weaker. God will test us to build us up. Satan will test us to tear us down. God will test us to make us stand. Satan will tempt us to make us stumble. Abraham's about to go through the test of all tests. I have a feeling that little Isaac grew up in front of Abraham, and (coughs) Abraham was just all wrapped up in the life of this little boy. I mean, he invested everything he had in this little boy's life. It was the boy, he was the boy of promise. I can just imagine that Abraham watched every move that boy made. He went to all of his ball games. He he gave him piano lessons. His first words were probably, Dada. I mean, I bet Abraham just stayed with him and taught him to say that before he could say anything else. Uh, He walked in Abraham's steps. I bet he was there when he took his first chariot ride, and he was there when he got his chariot license right there with him all the way. He just loved that boy, and he invested his life in that boy. One morning, Abraham, he's having his quiet time. He always did. And he said to God, here I am, Lord. I'm reporting for duty. What do you want me to do today? And God said, I want you to take your son, and I want you to sacrifice him to me. Can you imagine what Abraham must have felt that day in his heart. He must have felt that he had all the breath knocked out of him. He must have gotten sick in the pit of his stomach. His head was spinning. The world around him collapsed. The bottom fell out. The roof caved in. The walls were crumbling about him. He could hardly think, take my son and do what? Look at the contradiction that he was dealing with. In verse 18, God told him to offer up the one that he had said to Abraham, and Isaac, your seed will be called. He knew this was the child of promise. This was the the called child, the one from which Abraham would become the father of multitudes. And now God is saying, you take him and you sacrifice him to me. Sometimes there are impossibilities attached to our faith. How can God give this kind of command and yet keep the promise that he has made? So imagine the the wrestling, the struggle, the tension that was taking place in the heart and soul of this man Abraham. I want you to turn to Genesis 22 and see what happened. Genesis chapter 22. And let's see how this turned out. And look at verse 1. Genesis 22, 1. Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. 
Then he said, Take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son, and he split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. The Bible says he got up early in the morning. I doubt that he slept much that night. I doubt that he could get any sleep at all thinking about what God had asked him to do the next day. But when the Bible says he got up the next morning, that's the Bible's way of telling us that Abraham said to God, not my will, but thy will be done. He got up. He lived by faith. He was in the most severe test of his life, and he was going to be obedient to God. So he took his boy Isaac, and and up the mountain they went, and he took the servants, and they headed toward Mount Moriah. The Bible says he has the wood. He puts the wood on the back of Isaac. He has the knife to do the job. And in a moment, he knows the inevitable questions are going to come. So his boy looked at the wood and said, Dad, here's the wood. And Dad, here's the knife. But Daddy, where is the lamb for the burnt offering? How that must have torn his heart, the heart of Abraham. But in one of the greatest statements of faith in the entire Bible, in verse 8, see what Abraham said. My son, God will provide for himself a lamb. You know, the first time the word lamb is used, as far as I can tell, in the book of Genesis is right here where Isaac asked this question, where is the lamb? And then you get over in the New Testament to the Gospel of John, and the first time the word lamb is used is where John the Baptist pointed to Jesus and and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Isn't it interesting? First of the Old Testament, the question is asked, Where is the Lamb? First of the New Testament, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Up the mountain they go, and in a moment, Abraham's hands are are like lead, and he takes those stones, and he piles them up until they make an altar, and he takes the wood, and he places the wood on the altar, and he takes his boy Isaac, and he lays him down on the altar. I can almost see God. I, I, I can't imagine God in heaven saying to Gabriel something like this, Gabriel. Do you see that man down there? That's what I'm going to do one day, Gabriel. I'm going to take my only son and lay him on Calvary's cross. Abraham raised the knife. And if you look at verse 19, Hebrews tells us that that Abraham was concluding that God was able to raise his son up even from the dead. And the word concluding there means calculating or computing. In other words, what this says is Abraham so believed the promise of God that God had made him years before that even if he killed that boy, that God would raise him from the dead to keep his promise. That's how much he believed God in a time of testing. That's how much faith he had in a time of testing. In fact, if you look at verse 5 of Genesis 22, you see an indication of that faith. He said, the Bible says, And Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship, and we will come back to you. Not I will come back, we will come back. This man had faith in a time of severe testing that God would do what God said he would do, that God would keep his promise, that God would keep his word. And that's the way you and I are to live when we go through these times of adversity and testing in our life. We just need to get the promise of God and hold on to it like Abraham did no matter what. 
and say, I'm just going to trust God. Even as he raised that knife and he was ready to plunge it into the heart of his own boy, he still believed that somehow God would do what he said, even if he had to raise him from the dead. And just at the moment that the knife came down, he heard God speak. Abraham, yes, Lord. And right over there in a thicket was a lamb, a ram, and the thorns, a ram crowned with thorns, a thorn crowned lamb. And he took it and he placed it on the altar. And just the way that a thorn-crowned lamb was placed upon the altar of Isaac, God, God Almighty laid a thorn-crowned lamb, His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, on the cross to take away our sin. Isaac was as good as dead. But by a substitute, God gave Isaac his life back. And you and I are dead in sin. And it was by a substitute, the Son of God on that cross, that God gives us our life back. God did that for me. And He's done that for many of you. And He'll do it for you today if you'll live like Abraham did. By faith, if you'll place your faith in the Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, and all of God's people said, let's stand together.